If you've been on this channel long enough, you'll know that until about 11 or 12 years ago, I used to call myself an anarcho-capitalist, or ANCAP, or voluntarist. I was so into the philosophy, I wrote a book on it. I think what first drew me to it was the emphasis on freedom, how ANCAPs could make the basic case that we should all be free from coercion. Over time, through reading and discussion, I realized there was more to freedom than ANCAPs tended to acknowledge. There were a lot of issues they downplayed, like white supremacy, patriarchy, and ableism, as if they weren't relevant to the pursuit of freedom. They didn't know much philosophy, and they treated the Austrian school of economics like it was a science. And this seemed to lead many of them to scoff at and dismiss everyone who had a different way of seeing things. But I wanted to keep learning. This video is an introduction to some of the topics that I think ANCAPs and other libertarians would benefit from learning about. As requested, I'll be making it by reacting to Larkin Rose's latest video. I won't be giving Larkin's arguments my full explanation because I've addressed all these points before. What I'll do is put a thumbnail on the screen and a link in the description for each video that I've made that goes into more detail on the topic. In this video, Larkin talks about capitalism and corporatism and how obvious it is that capitalism is good. However, I was left with a lot of questions. The main one that felt unanswered was where is the line between capitalism capitalism and corporatism. If corporatism means getting help from the state and capitalism means not getting any help from the state or using any coercion at all, which rich people or businesses are not corporatist? Who would you call a capitalist? Are there any who haven't got help from the state? The state protects their property with the law and the police. It passes and enforces their laws. How do you separate capitalism from the state? One way to answer that question would be to define capitalism, but the only definition Larkin gives is in the comments. Again, I'm a little confused. First, surely dictionaries aren't the only place you go if you want to learn about something. You don't want to learn about the history of it? what philosophers say about it. There are whole fields of study dedicated to this topic, but a sentence in the dictionary makes all that irrelevant? But that's all we get. Second, are you sure that doesn't describe the system we have today? Larkin seems to see this as a trump card when it doesn't make the distinction between capitalism and corporatism any clearer. If I had to infer what Larkin Rose means when he says capitalism, I would say technological innovation. You're listening to me because capitalism exists. That screen in front of you exists only because capitalism exists. The wires in between exist only because capitalism exists. The electricity running along those wires. Everything involved, everything in this room, this building. Larkin says we only have computers, electricity, and anything else worth having because of capitalism. In what way could you demonstrate these things only exist because of capitalism. You can only have electricity and other stuff like that because some people own the means of production privately. If there were no law of maximizing profits and reinvesting surpluses, we couldn't make things. No other arrangement of people could figure out electricity and cars and improving something. Only people organized under a capitalist system. If those things were built by capitalism, but the firms who invented and built and innovated them all have intimate relationships with the state, doesn't that make them corporatist? And in fact, Kevin Carson made that point to Larkin, but Larkin just posted another dictionary quote and ignored the history lesson. So capitalism is all the things Larkin likes about the current system, and corporatism is all the bad things. I think. Larkin says to look at all the stuff you wouldn't have if the people with all the money hadn't decided to invent and produce it. What I want to know is, how did they get that money? How did they come to own everything? Who protects it for them? The state has been fundamental to all wealth accumulation. The state has always been there, protecting the wealth and property of the wealthy, passing their laws and legalizing everything they've taken. The money they invest in the things you like is the money they made by owning the stuff they appropriated. 
Not by working, just owning. Owning the things we like and the things we need. Why do we assume their ownership is legitimate? Because they used money regardless of where it came from? Or because the laws they wrote say so? To try to clarify corporatism, Larkin says it's wrong to start imperialist wars. And again, if by capitalism you mean the nasty warmonger, you know, BlackRock using you know government violence and and Lockheed Martin, who you know profits off of the blood of innocents, yeah, that's worth condemning because of the violence and coercion involved. But who starts these wars and why? How much wealth do they create for the wealthy? The decision to go to war is often made in corporate boardrooms because when the state goes to war, corporations go with it. They don't just get contracts to build bases, they get granted ownership of the resources of whole countries. They use their influence to rob people of their land and resources and force them into the labor market or into slavery. Everyone knows by now, many of our products are made by slaves who mine stuff for our phones, sew our clothes, and make hundreds of brands of food. BlackRock, Lockheed Martin. What do the shareholders in these corporations do with the money they make? What did the people who profited from the slave trade do with their money? They reinvested it. Slaves or employees create, and owners take and invest in companies that make computers and microphones and food and homes and all the good things. They use the money from the corporatist corporations to own the capitalist corporations and all the food and homes too. Which owners of which corporations are capitalists and which are corporatists? What's more, if we're celebrating owners of capital for all the supposedly good things they've brought, they couldn't possibly have made any other way than by concentrating wealth. Are we also crediting them with all the innovations in oppression? Do they get the credit for the design of the prisons, the jets, tanks, bombs, and missiles, the surveillance technology, or any of the environmental destruction they cause? While we're at it, do they also get credit for all the lies we learn in schools and newspapers and advertising? These decisions are made more in corporate offices than in government. The line between capitalism and corporatism is so blurry, you can say it's wherever you want it to be. If you buy something, it's because you value the thing more than you valued the money you gave up. For most of us, what we value, the things we spend money on, are things we need. We need food. We need clean water. We need a place to live. We need clothes. We need a bed because we need to sleep. We need soap and water to be clean. And you might need electricity, computers, your phone, and so on. After all those expenses, we might not have any money left to do the things that make life worth living. But since we're working at whatever hours our bosses determine, we might not have the time to do those things anyway. You both got richer through the transaction. That's funny because I have less money now. But at least I can go on living another day. You are rich because other people are richer. But we're not rich. We have some stuff. I know ANCAPs have no class analysis, but having stuff is not the same as owning property. We do not own property. Everything we have, we can lose as soon as we can't afford something we need. Look how many people go bankrupt trying to pay for health care. Look how prices of food keep going up. We have to either find ways to get more money, which isn't possible for everyone, or we have to go without. Surely one criterion of being rich is you don't have to worry about those things. This idea that wealth comes from taking it from somebody else is just economically stupid. It's common to make the claim that you don't lose anything when the rich get richer, but it's patently false. Money is a zero-sum game. There's only so much of it. If you get more, you got it from someone else, or else from the bank, which means now there's more money in circulation and everyone's money is worth a little less. Larkin's next couple of points let us go deeper into that last one. Oh, the rich got rich by stealing from the poor. Not exactly. They got rich by creating the poor. Great impression of Slavoj Žižek, though. You got that Ferrari by stealing it from people who didn't have Ferraris. Well, how the hell did they do that? This is why I talk so much on this channel about history. 
If you take a historical view of things, you can understand why we have classes, why there are a few really rich people, and why most of us cannot be considered rich by anyone but an ANCAP. Check out these videos for the longer version, but to keep it as concise as I can, wealth is created by taking it from people. ANCAPs should know this because it's the history of the state. People all over the world lived on land they used for their own purposes, but some people took ownership of it from them by force and enslaved them. These people created the institutions that evolved into what we now call the state. They instituted money, making everyone pay taxes in that currency so that everyone had to use it and therefore had to get it from whoever had it, i.e. the rich. So if you owned fields or factories, you could have as many workers as you wanted because people needed the money you had or else they would starve or be imprisoned. That's all still true today. People would rather do any shitty job than starve. And until unions fought and died for the right to strike, people worked all day, seven days a week, however dangerous the job was. It seems Larkin is a bit selective about what constitutes violence and coercion. When there are rich people who got that wealth by way of government coercion, yeah, they suck. That deserves condemnation because of the coercion. All capitalism is built on coercion. It has never been a voluntary institution. It took over from feudalism and spread around the world, creating huge amounts of wealth through huge amounts of violence and leading to the inescapable global capitalist system we have today. Finally, Larkin is unaware of horizontal or non-hierarchical organization. And even though I used to think the same, it seems strange in retrospect to think I used to call myself an anarchist and I didn't know about how people organize. How the hell do you think anybody is ever going to make that or one little chip in any of these things without a big frickin' factory that makes computer chips? Well, we'll have collective ownership. No, we won't. Larkin seems to think collective ownership is the opposite of a factory. And that any collectively managed project will fail unless there's a leader in charge who knows how to make the widget. It's funny because if you're an anarchist who argues with leftists, you've probably heard them say the same thing. Possibly along the lines of, how would you manufacture insulin without hierarchy? Which I address here. But I just don't get the objection. Can't they teach others how to make it? Or do they keep all that knowledge a secret so they can use it to enrich themselves at other people's expense? Surely not everyone who makes insulin now is that much of an asshole. They're just forced to be under the status quo in order to get a job. If they weren't, they could just make the information available and the places accessible so anyone could make it. Is everyone really claiming if they weren't coerced by the state or the need for money, nobody would ever make insulin? Either people would do it voluntarily and cooperatively, or it wouldn't get done. If you need slavery to make things, maybe we shouldn't have them. Larkin brushes off all arguments for collective ownership and organization, and just generally the idea that necessities of life should be accessible as spoiled and jealous and it, oh, well, now that's just uncalled for. At the end of this video, Larkin issues a challenge, but I don't think he really gets the argument and perspective of the people he's challenging. I wanna see a bicycle, just a bicycle, not a motorcycle. Not a car, not a laptop, not a phone, a bicycle, just a simple physical mechanism, a bicycle that was created from scratch with no profit motive and no capitalism. This tells me Larkin thinks if you want something, either you wait for someone with all the money to pay people to make something so you can have it, or you can try to make that thing from scratch, or you can't have it. I feel like this shows a lack of imagination. Why can't people own and do things together with no money involved? Do knowledge and organization just evaporate when you take money out of it? Is cooperation rendered impossible? No, and in fact, when you think of the huge amount of labor wasted on unproductive activities because capitalists want it, 
Everything from pushing papers around a desk, to designing advertising campaigns, to sitting in front of a screen watching their property. You realize we would probably have way more time to do what we wanted if we didn't have to serve them. Instead, we work at whatever capitalists want us to do for however long, just to have the privilege of accessing the things we need to survive. Because we need money, we do superfluous and harmful work, not just useful work, and we don't have the time and energy and health and money to do what we think is more important. If in a free society you wanted to spend your time working with some people who were manufacturing computers, great. You don't have to spend all day there, though, because you're in charge of your schedule, not some boss. If that means fewer computers get built, then okay. I don't want people to be coerced into working just because it's efficient and productive. But the change wouldn't necessarily mean fewer computers, since if workers were in charge of their workplaces, they would probably want to try to automate even more of the work. So there was that much less work to do, and again, they would have more leisure time. That's what technology would be if it were collectively owned, designed for and accessible to everyone, instead of only available if we have enough money. So if Larkin is right and we do owe all technological advances to owners of property, great, but obviously we don't need them anymore. And we definitely don't need them owning the resources we do need. The fact is, Capitalism is statism. To try to separate the two at any time in the past two or three hundred years ends up as an exercise in counterfactual history. Capitalism is inextricably tied to war, slavery, imperialism, and colonialism. What gets called corporatism is distinguishable from capitalism only to the extent it's arbitrarily defined as such. Either capitalism has been corporatism all along, in which case the word capitalism is useless, or corporatism has been capitalism all along. And we can go back to discussing capitalism as a real-world phenomenon and not a fantasy. That said, it's possible in recent years capitalism has morphed into something even worse. A few people have speculated on this topic. Yanis Varoufakis calls this new or retro system techno-feudalism, and he makes an interesting case. It's possible capitalism is no longer capitalism and we need to think about it differently. I don't want to give up the word just yet because it still seems quite relevant to the present and the past, but as things change, our understanding of them should change too. I suggest learning more of the history of capitalism and the labor movement, and actually listening to legitimate criticism without the knee-jerk reaction of, that's not capitalism. When I finally started doing that, I learned a lot.